No, no, we will do that later. Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me uh, in order to speak. Uh, I was actually told to speak about uh, comics, graphic novels, whatever you call it. And so, you know, I'll have a lot of pictures to show, a lot of, a lot of visual materials to show. And uh, instead of speaking generally about this, because it's such a big kind of a field, I chose one book uh, which I thought uh, has a lot of things uh, to tell about the genre I want to speak about. Uh, this is a book by the Australian author Sean Tan. And you know, this uh, essay which I've written, not an essay, just a discussion which I'll do, is in a kind of fond memory of a lost object as well. You know? Sean Tan wrote a, a book called The Lost Thing. I actually first encountered Sean Tan uh, via uh, Professor Obisi Gupta's book, which he says is now lost in transit. You know, that's like any book, you know, going on a voyage, it's somehow, the original owner actually testified to that, that that book is no more. But, you know, when I speak about Arrival, you know, um, Sean Tan is initially normally regarded as what I call a kind of a picture book writer. A children's writer who used to write a lot of picture books. Uh, there were picture books like The Rabbit, The Lost Thing, which actually, you know, pushed the boundary of the picture book. It is only when he actually wrote Arrival, you know, um, his books were stacked within what I call the graphic novel, you know, section of, it, of the bookstores. There's a politics behind that, but before going into that, let me speak about the book itself. Uh, the book is of course wordless. I can just make this a kind of a slideshow to show how brilliant the book is. Uh, it is a wordless comic. It's a wordless sequential graphic narrative. This is the end papers of the book. And these are all drawn, hand drawn, remember? And um, I will try to go through certain sections of the book because it's a 128 page tome. You know, I can actually pull out one picture from the book and you know, speak a lot about it. But I will just try to segregate certain things from the book and try to tell it about the book itself. Now one thing that you need to know that it is actually about a migrant story, a story of an immigrant, okay? And of course the land is unknown, he's from an unknown land and he's trying to go and migrate to another land which he doesn't know of, right? And while migrating, he's also separated from his own family. And that story is somehow defamiliarized into a kind of a surreal setting. And you know, and somehow presented to us. You know, uh, as you see these pictures, okay? Uh, let me begin uh, my paper. Uh, okay. Every voyage is the unfolding of a poetic. The departure, the crossover, the, the, the fall, the wandering, the discovery, the return, and the transformation of it all. If traveling perpetuates a discontinuous state of being, it also satisfies, despite the existential difficulties it often entails, to once an unsatiable need for detours and displacements. Travelers' tales do not only bring over their home and over here abroad. They not only bring the far away within reach, but also contribute to challenging the home and the abroad dwelling and traveling dichotomy within specific actualities. At first, at best, they speak to the problem of the responsibility of packaging a culture or of defining an authentic cultural identity. Traveling here inscribes itself as a deviance within a circularly saturated space. Adventure can only survive in small empty pockets of intervals and interstices. Sean Tan's The Arrival, which was written in 2006, is a 128 page wordless sequence of sepia toned images where the, visually, where the readers became visually engaged in the main character's struggle to navigate a nameless constructed geographic space and imaginary new world. 
Fleeing his serpent infested old world homeland and living behind two females, usually interpreted as the wife and the daughter, the migrant protagonist settles in a new world, new world's multi ethnic community that seamlessly, you know, meshes elements of the rest real with the fantastic. Strange creatures jump out of the familiar domestic objects, invented alphabets adorn the walls of a typical cityscape, and peculiar foods are served on the dining tables of everyday household. In arrival, such blending of the ordinary and the imaginary, together with the, in the book's genre, plant the reader in the shoes of an immigrant character. In a way, the protagonist of the arrival, you know, promotes the nomadic subject. Uh, you know, a, a subject, of course, a fractured, polyvalent form of the self who is not tied to any specific nation, place, or ideology. As you look at the pictures of the book, the first thing that strikes you, let me get back uh, to the beginning, is the genre of the, you know, work. Remember when Sean began this work, he wanted to make it a picture book for the children, 32 pages. The first outline, when it was submitted to the Australian publisher, was for a picture book. Later it expanded to a 128-page sequential graphic narrative. And, you know, when it actually debuted, uh, when, when, when it made its debut at Agulme, the French comic festival, it was classified as Mon de Sea, you know, the comic book. Okay? So, you know, the genre itself, is extremely problematic. You know, Sean started with something and, you know, he ended up with something bigger than he anticipated. Now, one thing that is very important to note, you know, Sean, actually, there is an essay by Sean called The Accidental Graphic Novelist. And he says, look, I don't care about comics or graphic novels. I started with certain outlines and then the work began to flow. It just came around me, you know. I don't want to theorize it. I'm an artist first, so for me, theorizing a work would be just redundant. Let me show you the first concept sketch that Sean made. Because, you know, I'm not to, con you know, you can read this in a very academic way, but I'm more, con you know, concerned with the craft of the artist in constructing the book itself. Uh, you know, when Sean first wanted to do something on a kind of a storybook on immigration. This was the first concept note that he drew. Look at this. This is a collage. And a collage is from old picture scraps. That is the first, you know, stirring of the story. And these are the sketches that he made, you know, around, around which the story was built. So it started off with a very kind of a, you know, kind of a whimsy a kind of a fancy that you want to create a city, you know, which is fantastical, which is something almost like a new world, right? But in his own terms. So this is the beginning of the book. Now, as he, you know, went ahead with his drawings, you know, things began to fall uh, into the, into, into places. Um, okay. Now, first of all, I, I just uh, quote Sean here because there's a beautiful quote. You will notice that I use the term comics and graphic novels interchangeably because I don't see much difference between them and I really don't care. Those terms describe an arrangement of words or pictures as consecutive panels on a printed page and that is what it matters to me last. The term graphic novel seems to be an elite connotation to me I would rather prefer my old term picture book or comics. Now, you know, Sean, uh, when he was actually talking about this graphic novel, he also formulated the way, uh, kind of the comics, he also formulated the way in which he will arrange this book. This book was to be arranged like a picture album. Remember, not using real pictures, but drawn pictures, you know, using pictures as a model. Uh, look at this, look at this end, end paper. You know, in this end paper, if you actually count, there are 60, there are 60 panels 
and all the 60 panels contain you know passport like pictures and these pictures are actually drawn on real characters these are all pictures that we found uh, these are all that fine you don't have to you don't have to give the light here and it's important to see this i i just tell from don't give this to yeah this is okay fine the thing is um, the, these all these pictures you know are arranged you know these are real pictures and based on real pictures and i will show you uh, because this is fascinating shown actually uh, just a minute look at this can you see these are real pictures right these are real archival pictures that he found uh, from you know of different refugees right in ellis island and so when shawn wanted to draw something you know or a kind of a immigrant story he uses those real pictures now look at this this the moment okay look these are drawn images but based on the same real pictures shawn wanted to give the book a look of a photo album remember the book has no page marks no page marks you know why because shawn wanted the reader to start at any point of time you can actually just go to the book and start at any place you know any page you know as you like because it will form a story in itself that's something that he intentionally did because when you look at a you know picture album you rarely look chronologically right you normally look at it haphazardly you try to turn page and look at you know pictures as it comes to you now remember one thing is very important here is that you know this idea of borrowing you know the models of this you know what i call the figures is very important there is a there's a beautiful term uh, which you know art spiegelman uses while drawing portraits you know why you have to draw portraits of the inhabit the character the word inhabit becomes very very important here shawn is actually inhabiting the characters of those unknown pictures in order to draw this gallery of portraits so it's very very important to know how shawn is trying to shape up the novel uh, or whatever the comic book whatever you tell graphic novel comic book in order to reflect uh, about his own idea of the migrants now the third thing that he wants to do is of course very very important thing that you need to know is that you know this book is also like a souvenir okay a souvenir but a souvenir of a lost time okay so like um, in the souvenir and i'll just quote someone very important a theorist susan stewart he says that you know the problematic of the nostalgia is that of the self the story's lost point of identity with the mother and its perpetual desire for reunion and reincorporation for the repetition that is not a repetition is the driving force behind the creation of a souvenir if you look at the novel itself you will see that shawn within that text you know introduces the idea of the souvenir let me give you this again look at the beginning of the book sorry just a moment uh okay so look at the beginning of the book look at the way look at this look at the folds the creases you know remember look at this you know language you cannot actually read this because this is a language created by shawn himself this is an unknown word you know this word doesn't mean anything to you and i will show you how shawn created a specific language for the book itself it's almost like the story of any migrant for example i go to say a new country and i don't know the language for me any sign anything will be as you know uh, as big as this look at the next one uh, look at this look at this there is an inspection card as well an inspection card as if you know the book is inspected the book is like an artifact which actually it's beginning its travel in time there is a date in it and the date is 1912 now this is based on a real inspection card that he got from a library so you know shawn is trying to you know what i call collect all what i call the materials that are lying around him 
and trying to, you know, make an artifact, the book itself. The book itself, the album, the souvenir, is a kind of artifact that he wants to construct. The artifact depicting the life of a migrant. So the madeness of the book, or the nature of artifact, nature of the book is extremely important when we read a book like this. Look at this now. Now you have a now you have something recognizable, right? This is in English, the arrival by Sean Tan. And then the story begins. Okay? Okay. Before going to the other things, let me also, you know, look at the story itself. If you see there are no words, there are no words, but if you look at all the pictures, you can easily make out that the story begins with a domestic surrounding, right? Everything, the objects that you see are all domestic, right? Within a domestic space. Very important to know the story begins with a bird. Now, bird, as you know, is a very you know common symbol of migration, right? Something that flies away, migrates. Okay. So when you are talking about a migrant going to a new country, you actually begin with a bird. But this is not a real bird. It is an origami bird. Remember, it's a bird which can be made by folding the page, you know, pages, you know, you can make the bird by folding the page. The entire act of folding and unfolding becomes almost a metaphor throughout the play, you know, throughout the book. The book is almost you know, as if an act of folding and unfolding begins. Then you have time, of course, you know, you have a hat. Look at this, all this, and there is also a drawing of, you know, a small drawing. Can you see a child's drawing, right? So there are no people right depicted except in the last panel when you can when you can see a family portrait right before that you can only see this and then you know that those are not real people they are actually you know the act of framing is done in such a way if you go to the next page you see that they are not real people but they are within a frame itself so it was also an artifact although the the it was, you know, the, the fact that it was an artifact was actually hidden. Then you see hands, you know. If you see the, if you read the comic, you will understand hands play a very, very important role throughout the comic. You know, because hands are also what I call symbolic of gestures. Gestures of communication, gestures of reaching out, gestures of responsibility. So you don't see the entire anatomical figure of the migrant initially, but you only see the hands. Then as you move, you actually move to the real scene and you know where the objects are. Remember? Can you see the objects now arranged here? So he actually separated the object and then tries to, you know, zoom out and see the scene and you can see that, you know, it's actually a domestic space where probably a man and his wife or partner is, you know, doing some packing. Okay? Now, again, the act of packing and unpacking is something that we'll find throughout the comic. Then, your, your, the, the whole comic, you know, shifts to something of the you know, little child. And look at the way the little child, the gestures of the little child are depicted. You don't know what is happening until you go to the next scene where you see that these people are traveling. And behind that, behind the behind the family, there is of course a kind of a shadow of a spiked creature. It can be anything, it can mean anything. Sean says that you know it can mean exploitation, whatever. It, it, it can symbolically mean anything. But the real inspiration behind this, you know, the drawing of this old world, which is you know almost fearful, which is almost you know, there's a looming threat of fear hovering over the real of the old world is actually taken from Goa, Goya. And you know, I, I just showed you some pictures of Goya. There is a series of 80 aquatils by Goa, which is called, you know, uh, Lost Street Cause. And you will see that, just a minute. Okay, I'll just, uh, now, if you see, yeah, of course, I haven't, you know, got all the 80 ones. You can just go to the internet and see the 80 aquatics. And you can see that, you know, there is in Goya, there is always that, you know, what I call the specter 
of the unknown, you know, the unknown animal, part of an animal body, intruding into a space which you know the humans feel disoriented with. Uh, again, you know, if you see, you know, these are all part of Goya's, and Sean actually acknowledges in one of the interviews that I am inspired by Goya. There is no doubt about it. When we have asked that whether you are inspired by Goya in depicting the threat, the specter of a threat in such a an amazing manner. Of course, the most famous, uh, if you look at this, and then look at the next one. Um, okay, just a minute. Okay, now look at the next picture. Next picture, of course, you can see, it's as if, you know, it's a bird's eye view. You can see, you can still see, you see the family, right? Can you see the family here? The family is still here, but you know, this shadow is actually this is the real thing and the shadow is falling on the <coughs> falling on the house, okay, on the facade. The entire city, the entire place is populated by the specter of, you know, fear. And, and, and the man is trying to escape from that. Um, and look at this, this is amazing because uh, in the initial part of the comic, you will see that there is a tendency of uh, Sean to construct what I call very democratic panels, you know, you know, panels which are very balanced, you know, they are all symmetrical and all that. Suddenly, when there is a idea of departure coming in, the panels are actually elongated, right? They are getting elongated. They are filling up the entire bleat of the page. The entire bleat, as if you know, it extends beyond the page. The fear that it, you know, when you are talking about a domestic environment, you know that you are within a square, you know that you are within some place which is extremely secure, but whenever there is a question of threat, you know, the pages are bled, you know, the bleed pages, uh, pages come in, and you know that the fear also exists beyond the book. The artifact of the book cannot contain the entirety of fear. So there is always this, you know, aspect that, you know, Sean wants to stretch the comic beyond the obvious mention of what I call the artifact of the book. Now, if we just go further, and the second part, we can see this man traveling, okay? And this man is traveling, you can see that man is traveling with a picture that he actually remembered in the first part. Have you seen the man looking at you? No, you can only see a man going through the course, or you know, the kind of, he's just going away somewhere. Nowhere, you can see the man looking at you. The gaze of the man is always withheld until you come to on one panel where the man is actually gazing directly to the reader. I will show you the panel. Look at this. Remember, in the first end paper, you see 60 panels of what? Of the portraits, right? Now here, as the man is traveling, you see similar 60 panels but the portraits are now displaced by clouds, which are formless. Look at the meticulousness of the portrait and compare it with the transience of the clouds, the cloud formation. And this is of course something that by which you can define time. There's a, it's almost like a moment to moment transition, which you can map as the man is traveling. And of course you know what the man is looking. This is the shape and the man is within the shape and the man is actually within the, you know, room in a shape. And this is what I call the bigger picture. The bigger picture of a ship being a speck traveling on the sea. This picture is amazing. This is a picture on the board of a ship. But remember, this is actually an imitation of a very famous painting. I will show you the painting. Uh, I'll show you the painting. Just a moment. Uh, okay, there is a painting. This is Tom Roberts coming south. Look at this painting. Look at this painting. This is Tom Roberts, a very, very famous painting of immigrants coming to New York. And look at, this is the first draft of the way that scene should have been. But he actually went back to Tom Roberts' painting. Can you see a similarity? Can you see the similarity? It is only that, you know, the elite ladies are replaced by the refugees. Okay? So he has just, you know, displaced the humans 
within the picture or the figures, human figures within the picture with something, you know, from an archival place. Now, this is very, very interesting uh, uh, to note. Just a moment. Just a moment. Uh, let me get back. Okay. And as you travel, this man is also writing a letter. This man is also writing something. He's not writing a letter, but any message the man sends is not in form of a language, but in form of the origami bird that you notice in the first, you know, page. So origami, as I have told you, the shape, you know, and, 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 and if you go through the entire comic, you will see that the origami bird actually becomes an origami fox as you go, right? So you can actually analyze this, you know, work, amazingly multi-layered work, you know, even from by panel to panel, you know, that is something which you can do. But as you go, there is a wonderful picture for the first time. Again, you see, the man's gaze is mapped here. But remember, the man's gaze is not directly looking at the reader. The man's gaze is actually looking somewhere in the sky, towards the sky. And what he sees are what these are what I call grasshopper like birds. He sends origami birds to his wife. And he encounters new kind of birds. Huh? Not for you on the table. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What is it? Okay, fine. Uh, and actually, he actually saw the origami like birds, in the, you know, uh, grasshopper like birds there. And then the man arrives at the new world. Now, this is interesting because look at this figure. The original inspiration is, of course, the Statue of Liberty. Remember? Very, very easy to understand. These two, you know, figures are almost imitative of that, the new world. And then the man actually goes to register himself. Register himself as a migrant in a new world, as a walker in the new world. Look at this scene. Now the scene is very important because this is again taken from a real world. This imitates the registration scene at Ellis Island. There is an archival photograph. And I will show you the archival photograph. Uh, just a moment. Oh, just a moment. Yes. Look at this photograph. Have you looked at this photograph? Of course, this is the same scene, right? It has just drawn the same scene, but just replaced the, you know, the United States flag with something, you know, much bigger. Now, this act of, you know, you know, inscribing the real with the fantastical is something this man does throughout the novel. And for the first time, for the first time, absolutely, look at again, he gets back to the symmetry of the frames. And within the symmetry of the frames, in the center of your vision, the focus of your vision, for the first time, if you look at these pictures, this picture with Again, the image of the picture that he's carrying is the first time that the gaze of the man, you know, looks back at the reader. The reader now becomes a secondary witness. Remember, the man is, of course, the primary witness, of, will be the primary witness of the new man. But the reader who actually reads the frame within the frame, remember, this is a frame, and you read the man looking at you, and then, of course, the man is also carrying another frame, which is the picture. So basically what you are doing, you are not only reading the man, you are not only reading him, but you are also reading what he has lost, the absence that he always carries with him. Now, this is a way, you know, which you, by which you can read this work. You know, you can read any comics in a very deep manner, or you can just read any comics for your, what I call, for enjoyment. I prefer the second. But since it is an academic seminar, you know, sometimes you need to read this in a very kind of a deeper way. But it's also a kind of engagement that makes you feel, uh, it's, very, it's very important to engage uh, the, uh, comics in this way because it sometimes gives you an idea of how art works, you know. What, what is there in, in art that, you know, that draws you in, okay. And remember, if you want to read, a picture or a, any kind of art, it, it, you cannot just read the way you all read it, you know, we all read it, right? Because, you know, that kind of reading somehow doesn't take into account a lot of other things that formally the panels can do, the, the act of framing can do, 
the act of composition, the, the way an image is inserted within a narrative, the way you are located within the narrative, you are located vis-a-vis -vis the frame can do. So, you know, I just end this uh, with a small thing that I wanted to uh, talk about and uh, uh, this is something that I had in mind. I'll just show you this and I will end this. Uh, the act of framing and unframing. I'll just end this um, lecture with one panel. Okay. Okay. Look at this panel. Have you looked at this panel? Uh, this is about memory, right? About remembering, remembrance, right? The man was feeling very alone. Uh, in the place where he is there, but remember, he is also carrying the memory of his family. How do you depict that? It's almost like a hologram, like 3D quality. When he opens the box, the box that was packed with so much care, he actually doesn't find any material there. Of course, there is a picture frame that he carries, we all know that, but instead of the picture frame, he could have easily drawn the picture frame, is actually inserted a real you know, domesticated space in which his family is probably, it, of course it's an imagined domestic space, he, he doesn't know what the mother and the daughter is doing, but it, it is the way the person is imagining the space to be. So it, it's the way, you know, in which you can actually bring out the memory. So the book itself, the artifact, you know, the, the, the nature of the book, the object of the book itself is almost like a mnemonic of the memory the memory that you have lost and probably will never retrieve and what will be left with you is only that book itself, the materiality of the book, the page marks, the bookmarks, the dog folds and whatever you will perform while reading the text. Thank you. I see that uh, many of the techniques used are cinematic in nature. Right, right, yes, very cinematic. And uh, this is quite uh, different from, say, the artwork of uh, Spiegelman. Yes, definitely. Because uh, mm -hmm. even in Mouse, uh, mm -hmm. I saw that most of the camera angles mm -hmm. of the viewpoints mm -hmm. were more or less from a medium right. range. Right. Whereas uh, the so-called yeah. angles were far more varied over here. Absolutely. And much of the meaning has to be supplied by the viewer. Yes. It is uh, yes. reminiscent in a way of Zika Vettov's A Man with the, 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 the Movie Camera. You are right. Absolutely. You know, the act of looking, you know, you know, remember, it's not only the migrant who is looking, you as a reader is also looking and poring over the book. That is very important. So, you know, the book not only exists in the book itself, but when you are looking at the book, you are not only looking at the migrant, looking at other things, but it's also the way you map itself. It's kind of a cartography that's frightening sometimes. See, you know, think of yourself within the cartography of that unknown territory. Forget about the migrant. If you yourself, in, if you inscribe your own body within that cartography, which is almost terrifying in nature, something that we don't know, that is always withheld, you know, it's almost like a, it, it triggers a kind of a reaction. And so you are right, actually. I was wondering whether uh, is partly uh, influenced by some of Zizek's ideas on capturing absences? Zizek, I don't know. I mean, he, he not, uh, you know, Tan, like most of the artists, say that I don't read any stuff, right? It, it, I don't read academic, I, I don't care about academics. In academic doctoral thesis has been written over Tan, of course. Tan is, Tan is a huge, you know, almost like a maverick now. You know, it would be very interesting to know that you know, Zizek is very interesting because, you know, uh, uh, you know, especially with respect to violence, the way, you know, Zizek depicts violence, Sean has actually done a new work on green fairy tales. It, it just is coming out and here he hasn't actually obliterated the book. There is no book. If there is a book, but remember, the book is not, you know, drawn. It is sculpture which is photographed and printed within the book. So he's actually taking it to a deeper level, you know, he's actually making it more 3D than 2D now. He's just, you know, that other dimension is coming. Questions?